want to turn your mind this evening towards the cross and towards uh, the passion of the Christ. A few years ago, I was very intrigued by this thread that I saw within particularly the Gospel of Matthew about the silence of Jesus uh, as he went through the passion narrative. It is, uh, it is a point of emphasis, and I wanted to think through and discover why was Christ intentionally silent. We must begin with the fact that it is completely against our nature. Whenever accusations are hurled against us, to be silent. It is completely in our nature to run to our own defense. Even if we are wrong, I don't know if you recall, uh, way back in the 70s, there was a murderer named Ted Bundy who was convicted, but all the while he always insisted upon his innocence and he challenged and challenged and challenged up until the very end when his impending death was right around the corner. And then suddenly, uh, as there was just weeks before his death, he said, all right, I did it, uh, but I bet you guys want to know all the details about where and where to find the bodies and all that sort of stuff. Why? Because it is in our nature to postpone, to deflect, to try and scratch and claw any way out of trouble that we might. And yet, Christ was the complete opposite. Isaiah 53, verse 7, tells us that this is coming. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Let us begin in the garden. In the garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus makes his final plea. His plea is to his father, a son crying out, Abba, Father. He says, all things are possible for, me, for you. Please remove this cup from me. Three times he prays for hours, it says. Hours, at least an hour each time. The return silence is deafening, it's shocking. But what you find after that is that Jesus moves forward through the passion narrative with an unwavering resolve. You see, at that point, he knows that he is the silent lamb of God. He gets up, and as he sees the mob coming to him in the garden, whereas Adam hid in the garden, Jesus runs towards the mob and presents himself. He goes willingly all along the way. Now, when we say that Jesus was silent during his passion, we don't mean that he didn't utter even one word. What we mean is that he did not offer self-defense. He did not offer self-justification. There was no explanation. After the mob captures him, they take him, and, and he will endure six trials throughout that evening and on into the morning. These trials are a sham. There's nothing even remotely legal about these trials. Witness would come forward, witness after witness, that are hurling accusation after accusation against them. They are hoping anything would stick. And Matthew 26 tells us, 
the high priest stood up and said to him, do you not answer what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. Put yourself in his shoes. Would you have kept silent while false accusation after false accusation is made? The next morning, he goes before Pilate. He is being accused by the chief priests and the elders. And Matthew 27 reminds us he did not answer. Pilate said to him, do you not hear the many things that they testify against you? But he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. Pilate, hoping to appease the crowd, which, by the way, the crowd is in complete contrast to Jesus. The crowd demands in their loud, insistent cry, crucify him, crucify him, as Jesus stands there silently. It will be the threats of mob violence, them, them demanding that they must be heard. Pilate cries out in Jesus' place. Why? What has he done? Pilate is so struck by Jesus' silence, his lack of response, he takes him back into the back room a second time, but Jesus gives him no answer. Pilate's reply, do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? But Jesus answers nothing. Even while he hangs on the cross, he is taunted by a thief. He is taunted by his executioners. And all he says is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Jesus' final groan, Matthew 27, verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. You see, the Lamb of God remained silent until he groaned his last. Why? Why is it so important that he was silent? Two things I want to tell you real quickly. One, he stands in the silence of the condemned. The most horrific scene in the whole of the Bible is in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, Paul has been articulating that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. His entire argument climaxes in three verses 19, where he paints a quick picture of the courtroom at the end, when the books will be open and the charges will be read and everyone will stand before the holy judge of the universe. And Paul says, your mouth will be shut. You will have Nothing to say in return. It's the silence of the condemned. It is why through this entire scene, once Jesus leaves the garden, he is resolved to stand in the silence of condemnation. Secondly, he carries our shame. There is shame that goes with the sin. Do you remember all through Jesus' uh, ministry how, how uh, they always tried to trip him up? They were always looking for ways to get him. But he would, he would just make one little comment. And, and their entire argument would fold like a deck of cards. Jesus doesn't respond because he's not defending himself. He's taken on our sin and he's taken on our shame. As they mock him, as they accuse him, he is receiving all of our shame. He, he gives no defense. Rather, he's silent in the shame of accusation. He gives no justification. He's silent 
in the shame of public mocking. He gives no rebuttal. He's silent in the shame of a criminal's condemnation. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. And yet while the sheep is dumb and unknowing, Jesus knew. He had taken on our sin and he had taken on our shame so that we might be set free. Would you pray with me? King Jesus, we praise your name. There is no one like you. who could enter into our sin, who would enter into our shame. We thank you. We praise you with our whole lives and our whole hearts. And we ask for you to give us more strength so that we would be able to praise you more and to understand more all that you have done. On our behalf, it is in your name we pray.